Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of being able to open your words again. We thank you, dear Father, that you have been guiding us in the Sabbath school as well as now the message. Everything said in the Sabbath school is what I'm saying today in the message, and that was not planned. So I know your Holy Spirit is leading our group. I know the Holy Spirit is leading our mission. Bless us, Lord, as we study today. May the truth that you have given to me, may I not pretty it up or flower it, but give it as you have given it to me. Father, I don't want to stand in the way between me and your people. I don't want blood on my hands, on my shoulders. Help me to be a faithful watchman and declare thus said the Lord. Lead us to repentance, recover our souls from sin, and save us by your divine grace. And when you come, please, Lord, may the reception of this message prepare us locally and online for your soon coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Those online, we invite you to turn with us in our Bibles to Revelation 14. And we thank you for joining us for our study this evening. Revelation chapter 14. Let's go there. Revelation chapter 14. Now, friends, we were here last week in Revelation chapter 14. And what I said last week, I'm going to say it again as I start this message. And that is that the gospel must be given with a loud voice. A loud voice. In Revelation 14, verse 6 and verse 7, the Bible says that the first angel's message that calls us to fear God, give him glory, the hour of his judgment has come. That is the everlasting gospel that should go to every person, nation, kingdom, tongue, and people. In verse number 7, the Bible says that this gospel must be given with what kind of voice? A loud voice. It says in verse 7, sing with a loud voice. Then we look at verse 9. The Bible says the third angel that calls us to acknowledge who the beast is and the mark in the image and not to worship should also be given with a loud voice. Verse 9, and the third angel followed them saying with what? A loud voice, a loud voice. And we said in our message last week that it sounds like the world is louder than the church when preaching the three angels' messages. That the those in um, politics, those in the state's position, those who are the governors and, and mayors and rulers of the land are speaking about blue laws, speaking about Sunday laws, loud from their podcast, loud from their political pulpits. They're loud. When the Seventh-day Adventist Church conference on down, even in self-supporting ministries, are very silent on the national Sunday law that's to come. And so, friends, we must give the message with a loud voice. The Bible says we must give it with a loud voice. The Bible says, Isaiah 58, verse 1, it says, Cry aloud. And spare not, lift up thy voice like what? A flute. That's what it says? Uh-uh. A flute is not loud enough. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Show my people their transgressions and the house of Israel their sins. So the Bible says we must give the message of what? Talk to me. A loud voice. So we need to sound the message that Jesus is soon to come. Probation is soon to close. And a Sunday law is brewing. Jesus is soon to come. We must give this message down with a loud voice. We're told the work that John the Baptist did is similar to the work that we do in these last days. And John the Baptist gave the message with a loud voice. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, it says, This is he that was spoken of the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one doing what? Crying in the wilderness. Loud voice, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So John the Baptist was crying, yelling his voice in the wilderness, preaching the message for that time, preparing people for the first advent. Therefore, we are to do what? Have a loud voice, preparing people for the what? The second advent of Christ. And all throughout the Bible, we studied this, that in the Bible, it seemed as if the world was always louder than God's church. John the Baptist was louder than those in the synagogues. John the Baptist in the wilderness was louder than those who were the priests in the synagogues. John the Baptist was louder than the Jewish nation, God's nation, who rejected Christ. The wise men were louder than those people who should have been studying in those synagogues and schools. The wise men followed the light and they were louder they, with the message that they're going to worship God. The woman at the well was louder than the disciples, the Samaritan woman was louder than those of Christ's disciples preaching the message, doing the word. Alright? So friends, in these last days, it won't be any different. 
that the world will be louder. And the world, church and state positions, are louder than even some Adventists when it comes to preaching the three angels' messages. Now, friends, we won't go into this because we looked at this last week. But remember what we talked about last week. It, it says, this gentleman here was preaching at, uh, his name is Clark Corbin, or Corbin Clark. And he was preaching, an elder of a church, how a Sabbath-keeping church transformed society with Corbin Clark, an elder. And he was preaching loud from his pulpit that we must legislate Sunday. Remember we said this? And in the video, he said that Seventh-day Adventists are what? Weird, Weird for keeping Seventh-day, the Sabbath, not Sunday. The title of our sermon this morning is How a Sabbath-Keeping Church Transforms a Society. That's a bold title, but I think it's true. And hopefully this morning, you'll see that it's true. Now, a principle we have to keep in mind right off the bat is that the Lord blesses a Sabbath-keeping society. The Lord blesses a society that values the Sabbath. And the Lord curses a society that does not keep the Sabbath, that has no value on the Sabbath. The Lord blesses a people that keep the Sabbath day. And he cuts off a people that do not. We, in America, used to be a people that knew what this meant. We used to know how to keep the Sabbath day holy. In America, we used to have laws that regulated our Sunday mornings and our whole Sunday gathering. These laws are known as blue laws. These laws forbade regular work on Sundays. You couldn't go to your job on Sundays. It was illegal. It also forbade any buying, selling, traveling, any public entertainment or sports. Many of these laws are still in place today. In my old home state in Indiana, I grew up remembering people who were frustrated because they couldn't buy alcohol on Sunday before they went to the Colts game. That's a distinct memory in my mind. These blue laws are still in effect. They're still part of our, our present life. In North Dakota, there's a law that says, quote, large retail stores shall not be open until noon on Sunday, end quote. This is obviously to encourage Sunday morning worship. You need to go to church in North Dakota, not go to the store. These laws have become more of a rarity for us today than a norm. This idea of leading a culture through legislation, leading a culture through legislation, leading a culture through legislation is foreign in our minds. It was not in early America, but for us today, this is a hard concept. We don't like it when there's restrictions placed on what we can and cannot do. There's an aversion in our hearts to hear from anybody what we're allowed to do or not allowed to do on Sunday. We want to go to Costco. We want to shop on Amazon. We want to be able to go pick up beer before the Colts game. These are things that we want to do, and we don't like it when these laws butt in the way. But the question is, should we be doing these things? Should we be going to Costco? Should we be shopping on Amazon? Chick-fil-A is known for their Sabbath keeping. They're known for their chicken sandwiches. They're known for their awesome sauce. But they're also equally known for their Sunday morning or their Sunday day abstinence from business. Yet Chick-fil-A is one of the most profitable businesses in the fast food industry. Why? Because the Lord is blessing them. He's blessing them for their Sabbath observance. Chick-fil-A has the idea. We want our children to do these laws, to live according to God's laws. We have to be able to say things like, if you want to love God, you'll keep the fourth commandment. You'll keep the Sabbath day holy. God rested on the seventh day to give you a pattern to model your life after. That's why he rested on the seventh day. This leads us to our second question this morning of when is the Sabbath? When do we observe the Sabbath day? It's important to note here that worship and Sabbath have always gone together. Jesus obviously intended for worship and Sabbath keeping to go together. So we too have to make them go together. We worship God this morning on Sunday because Sabbath and worship go together. When Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose from the grave on the third day, the first day of the week, he started a new creation. It's clear that this day, Sunday, became the day for the early church. This has been one of the rare points of unity in church history and across almost all Christian denominations, apart from the weird Seventh-day Adventists, apart from the weird Seventh-day Adventists, weird Seventh-day Adventists, all Christians, whether you're Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Protestant, all different types of Protestants, we all gather and worship God on the first day, on Sunday. We're unified in this. When we neglect the law, the world neglects the law. If we don't value the law, why on earth would those who don't have Christ value the law? We have to see the societal implications of Sabbath keeping. We have to see that not just your own personal relationship with the Lord is at stake in your Sabbath keeping, but all of our community is at stake. We have to see that when we keep the Sabbath as a church, we're teaching Prescott what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a Sabbath keeping Prescott. We don't just want general Christian culture. We want Christian laws. We want Christian laws. We want laws that reflect God's good law. We want... Again, I'm showing this 
to show us that the world is louder than the church. I'm showing this to show us the world is louder than the church. He said that Sunday would make society better. He said that Sunday would be better for us if we close stores and not go to restaurants and not go to businesses and not go to games, but go to church. He says that it would stop the the, the, the violence and crime in society, all right? That Sunday legislation, blue laws, must be brought back. Now, friends, we're told that we must give the message with a loud voice, all right? I just want to read the part at the very bottom. Let the watchmen now lift up their voice and give the message, which is present truth for this time. Let us show the people where we are in prophetic history and seek to arouse the spirit of true Protestantism, awakening the world to a sense of the value of the privileges of religious liberty so long enjoyed. So the watchmen must lift up their voice because Sunday is on the horizon. We must give the message with a loud voice. Now, what I want to show you today is that I want to show you the agitation that many in the political world, many in the state's position are calling for Sunday laws. Why is it the world is talking about this more than Seventh-day Adventists? Watch this, friends. You'd be surprised to see this. Watch this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. May oppose commerce on Sabbath and required observations of the Sabbath. Blue laws. Everyone desires Sabbath rest. Talk about Sabbath laws and blasphemy laws. I guess I would argue for re restoring Sabbath blue law. The Sabbath and the sacred Sabbath and obscenity laws. Would be like Sabbath laws. It has to be by force. When we take power, they need to be given the death penalty. And these people that are suppressing the name. So many individuals were calling for what? Sabbath laws, Sabbath blue laws, Sunday laws. Someone said it must be by force. Someone said bring the death what? Penalty. Revelation chapter 13. Do we see these things fulfilling, friends? Yes. So with agitation, we must give the message with what? A loud voice. And how do we get ready for this time, friends? Because the world is preaching this message. The world is preaching this message, but the church is not preaching it. So how do we get ready for this event? In order for us to be ready for the mark of the beast crisis, we all must reflect the image of Jesus fully. One more time. In order to be ready for the mark of the beast crisis, we all must do what? Reflect the image of Jesus fully. Early writings, page 71, paragraph 1. I also saw that many do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Watch this last sentence now. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect, must reflect what? The image of Jesus fully. So in these last days, if we're going to be ready for the time of trouble, for the mark of the beast crisis, we must look like who? Jesus. And not partially, but how? Fully. We must fully look like Jesus. So my question is, do you look like Jesus or do you look like Satan? Do you look like Jesus or do you look like the devil? If we're living like the devil, looking like the devil, we will not receive the seal of God. All those who reflect the image of Jesus will receive the seal of God. So we must ask God to help us to look like Jesus. How? Fully. Now, if we look like Jesus partially, is that enough, friends? We have traits of the devil. If that's your say amen. So we must ask God to help us to reflect the image of Jesus. How? Fully. And Sister White says that there's devils in the church. Yes, friends. There's devils where? In the church. As a matter of fact, majority of the devils are not in the clubs right now. They're not at the bar right now. They're not in the stadiums and the gymnasium halls. The Most of the devils are in the church. And most of God's people are in the world. Yes, right now. Most of God's people right now are in the world. Once they hear the message, they will come and receive Christ. But most of the devil's people are where? They're found in the church. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 122, paragraph 3. We have far more to fear from where? Within than from where? Without. The hindrances to strength and success of the church are far greater from the church itself than from where? From the world. So the majority of those living for the devil, looking like the devil, speaking like the devil, acting like the devil, are not in the world. Where are they, friends? They're in the, in the church. And they're hindering the gospel word. They're hindering the success of the word. They're hindering the message from going forward. So my question is, Lord, am I a devil? Am I a devil? 
Devils are hindering the gospel work. Devils are hindering God's message from going forward. Devils are hindering God's word. So we must ask ourselves, self-examination, Lord, is it I? Remember the disciples? Jesus says, one of you will betray me. What did the disciples say? Lord, is it I? We must ask ourselves, am I a devil? The enemy within. There's an enemy within. Lord, am I a devil? And let me just say this, friends. Don't be alarmed. But the devil is not wasting his time going to bars and clubs. He already has those people. The devil now is attending church. Are you with me? Say amen. The devil goes to church. Mark chapter 1, verse 23 to verse 26. And there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. For we, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked them, saying, Hold thy peace, come out of him. And when he, the unclean spirit had torn him, he cried with a loud voice. So the devil went to church. The unclean spirit went to church. And watch this, friends. Notice, when the devil went to church in this man, disguised himself, went to church, the Bible says in verse number 24, the devil said, what have I to do with thee, O Jesus? Are you with me? Say amen. So there are people that come to church, but that doesn't mean you want Jesus. There's people that come to church, but that doesn't mean you want truth. People that come to church, that doesn't mean you want conversion. If that's your say amen. The Bible says the unclean spirit went to church. What have I to do with thee? Leave me alone. Don't talk to me about truth. Don't talk to me about this or that. Leave me alone. But why'd you come to church? The Bible says now in Luke chapter 4, verse 33, verse 34, Luke's account, that this unclean spirit was an unclean devil. The devil went to church. Luke 4, 33 and verse 34. It says, in the synagogue, there was a man which had what? The spirit of an unclean devil. And cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know who thou art, the Holy One of God. So the devil went where? To church. And the Bible says he went to church, but did not on Christ. Are we going to church? but really don't want Christ? Are we going to church every Sabbath, but don't want Christ? And Luke chapter 4, verse 16, this was a Sabbath day. Jesus stood up for to read. The Bible says the man was filled with the devil in the church on the Sabbath. You can be coming to church on the Sabbath and be filled with the devil and not want Jesus. The devil comes to church. Are you with me? Say amen. We must ask ourselves, am I a devil in God's church? Oh, friends, Jesus had power over the devil, but the devil still came. Do we want, are we a devil in God's church? So what are we getting from this? The devil shows up the church. Follow me now. The devil came to disturb what Christ was doing. Mm. Satan had no power over Christ. Watch this. How did the devil come to that church? Through this man that had an unclean spirit. He can come through individuals, people, right? The devil comes with false doctrines, right, to break up unity. And also, he masked himself in the presence of a human man. So, friends, listen, we must examine ourselves. If we have any trait that is unlike Christ, to be ready for the mark of the beast crisis, we must reflect the image of Jesus. How? Fully. We must say, Lord, if I have any traits of the devil, help me to repent, confess, and turn from them, because I don't want to be filled with the devil's traits. Are you with me? Say amen. Oh, we got to ask ourselves, are we filled with the devil? And again, don't be surprised when the devil comes to church. Why? The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 that the devil was once where? In heaven. Revelation 12, verse 7. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought on his angels. And prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the, talk to me, the devil was and Satan. At, at the sea with the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So the devil was where? In? And if the devil can be in heaven, there can be a devil in the church. If that's your say amen. Where the Ten Commandments of God are, where the holy worship of God was, the devil was right there. So the devil will be in God's church. Ezekiel chapter 28, the Bible says, Lucifer was created to love and fear God, but something happened in his heart that made him the adversary, that made him the devil. The Bible says, Thou art the anointed cheer up that cover it. I have set thee so, 
Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. The devil was on the holy mountain of God. He's constantly trying to be in the presence of God's people to hinder God's work. Are you with me? Say amen. Thou hast walked them down in the midst of the stones of fire so the devil can come to church. I'll give you another one. Job chapter 2. Remember when the sons of God came to gather and worship God? Where was the devil, friends? Right there at that godly meeting. Are you with me? Say amen. The Bible says, Job chapter 2, verse 1, Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down the nit. So the devil saw there was a godly meeting, a spiritual meeting, so the devil went to church. If that's your say amen. Oh, friends, listen, we got to examine ourselves. Are we coming to church have nothing to do with Christ? Don't want Christ. Don't want truth. Don't want to be saved. We don't want anything to do with Jesus in our lives. But yet we still come to church. We got to ask ourselves, am I a devil in God's house, friends? Listen, Satan comes to godly meetings. And why does Satan come? In Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says he is the accuser of the brethren. He comes to criticize. He comes to ridicule. He comes to gossip. He comes to slander. He comes to tear down. He's coming with ulterior motives. Satan comes to church. Are you with me saying that? Oh, friends, he didn't come to worship. Not once did we see in these scriptures that Satan came to worship. He came with ulterior motives. Oh, friends, so the devil comes to church. Are you with me saying amen? And the devil has a heart problem. You know the Bible says, <laughs> we worship him with our mouth, but what does it say? Our heart is what? <laughs> the devil's heart was far from Christ while he was in heaven. Didn't really in his heart love Christ. Didn't really in his heart love God. But he had ulterior motives as he came to worship. And he was spreading news to the angels in heaven to get them to go against God. The devil comes to church. Right? You have to be saying amen, friends. Listen, Ezekiel 28, verse 12 and 13. Son of man, take up a limitation upon the king of Tyrus, saying to him, Thus said the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been to eat in the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carnacle, and the gold. The workmanship of thy tablets, of thy pipes, were prepared in thee from the day that thou was created. Now notice verse 12. Bible says God made an angel in heaven. We know this as Lucifer. Same, same being, Isaiah 14. The Bible says he was full of wisdom and what? Perfect and what? Now what made Lucifer beautiful? Was it the jewelry he had on? No. It was his heart before sin. How do we know this? Notice what it says. The net in verse 15. All right? The Bible says, thou what? Was perfect. So when his heart turned against God, the Bible says thou was perfect. He still had on the, those jewels at that time. But God said you're no longer what? Perfect in beauty. You see that? Verse number 12. Perfect in beauty. The beauty was in his where? In his? He had a heart for God. He was worshiping God as spirit and truth. But when his, he lost the heart religion, his heart for God, the Bible says thou, art, thou was perfect in thy ways. To the day that thou was created, until sin, lawlessness, iniquity was found in thee. Verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee down to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that thou that they may behold me, the whole thee. So Lucifer had a heart issue. His heart was not in the right place. He was physically in the right place, but his heart was not in the right place. He was speaking words to destroy the influence of Christ. He was not with the program. He was not with the standards of the will of God. He wanted his own agenda and to lead the angels with his own agenda. Are you following me, friends? The devil went to church. The Bible says he was jealous over Christ and his position and wanted more and wanted the angels to side with him. He went to church for the wrong reason. Friends, what, what is the reason why we're here? Let's examine ourselves. So what was in the devil's heart? The devil was not satisfied. He wanted more than what God wanted to give him. Oh, friends. Doesn't the Bible say we need to be content? Yes? All right, friends. 
the devil also, what was in his heart? He wanted to receive something that God did not want him to have. This, this is just what we're just studying scripture. Are you going to say amen? All right, friends, watch this now. Matthew 15, Jesus says, Oh, my people, the people, they draw nigh to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. The same problem. But in their heart is what? It's far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So, friends, listen. The devil will come to church in these last days. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. And we need to examine ourselves, lest we be a devil, lest we have the characteristics of Christ. Coming to church does not make you a Christian. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Oh, friends, we need the love of Jesus in our hearts. I'm going to give you something more. The devil studies the Bible. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, the Bible says, Therefore rejoice ye heaven. And ye that dwell in them, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and sea, for the devil, the devil, the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, knowing that he has what? How does the devil know his time is short? Ah, he studies his Bible. Are you please amen? Listen, the devil studies his Bible. He knows prophecy. He knows time is short. But the Bible says he's a devil. Oh, friends, am I a devil in God's church? Listen. And the devil only likes to study prophecy. Prophecy. How much time do I have and what can I do? He doesn't study how to be saved. How can I be changed? How to be converted? How to have a deeper prayer life? How to be kind? How to be loving? Nothing. Just prophecy. And there are individuals all over the church online and in local churches, SDA churches, even in praying truth circles, all they want to study is prophecy, Sunday law, Sunday law, Sunday law. But when it's time to talk about heart change, full surrender, receiving the character of Christ, conversion, repentance, nowhere to be found. Are you with me saying amen, friends? The devil comes to church. Yes. He studies his Bible. All right. It says Satan is a diligent student, Bible student. He knows that his time is short, prophecy, and he seeks at every moment to counterwork the work of the Lord upon the earth. So the Bible says that Satan is constantly trying to undo the work of the Lord, and his constant mind is on prophecy. Are you saying amen? Now again, is there anything wrong with prophecy? We just have to have a balance with the message. Prophecy was given that we have Christ in our hearts, but the, he's not even wanting Christ in his heart. He just wants to study prophecy for what reason? To be fancy and tell everyone what you know. So friends, are we a devil? Let's examine ourselves, friends. He has no relationship with Christ. Isaiah chapter 14. He wants to exalt self above who? That's what the devil does. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, that this what? Weaken the... Let me, let me say this, friends. Those who are devils just weaken people's faith in God's word. Those who are devil want to make them mistrust, distrust the promises and the word of God. They want to make you doubt what you've studied, what you've learned, what you read. The ceiling time is settling into what? God's truth. What do the devil does? He wants to weaken you in God's truth. Second guess, doubt the truth. Are you with me, friends? Verse 13. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above what? The stars of... What does the devil want to do? I want to be in that place, above this place, above this person, above, and they want to put the other person down. Friends, are we a devil in God's church? Listen, I will sit above upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. The table of showbread was in the north of the sanctuary. Are you following me, friends? They want to now explain scripture as if they know it all without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and mislead people on the truth. Am I a devil in the church? Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the side of the pit. So the devil wants to, to receive the attention that belongs to Christ. He wants to receive the worship that belongs to Christ. He wants to put self in the place of who? Oh, friends, am I putting my will above the will of God? Am I choosing my way above the ways of God? Do I want my life of sin more than the life of Christ? Am I a devil that's going to church? We've got to ask ourselves this. 
And friends, listen, the devil wants to exalt self in the place of God. You know what's so interesting? The devil always won worship. When he was in heaven, guess what he wanted? Worship. Then he was cast out to the earth in the Garden of Eden. Guess what he wanted? Worship. Then he came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, and Jesus was praying and fasting. What did, Jesus, what did the devil want? Worship. And now in these last days, in Revelation chapter 13, the beast from the earth, beast from the sea, papacy, United States, the, the culmination of the market of these crisis, what is the devil wanting in these last days? Talk to me. Worship. Worship. Dev listen, listen carefully. Devils want attention upon themselves. Devils want to be focused on as the primary thing that's important. They want everyone to look at themselves. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit will not speak of himself because the Holy Spirit is too busy speaking about Jesus Christ. Oh, friends, am I a devil? Do I always talk about self, self, self? No place for Christ. Oh, listen. The Bible says he wants to ascend above the house of the clouds. He desires worship from heaven to the Garden of Eden, Jesus in the wilderness, the beasts of the earth, and also he wants his way. He's desiring worship. He's desiring attention. The only attention the devil got was when he fell from heaven and everyone looked down and saw his fall. What a lesson for us, friends. The only attention we should desire to have is the attention of God. He's enough. We don't need the attention of the world. Are you with me? Oh, friends, church is not a performance. We're here to worship God. Amen? And the devil was there with wrong intentions. That's why the first angel's message is to fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment to come, and worship God. It's time to put the attention where it needs to be back on God. Are you to say amen? Because the devil wants attention in these last days. Oh, friends, listen, if we want the attention all for ourselves, there's some people that come to church and they oh, the sob, sob, sob stories talk about themselves all day long. Friends, listen, they need deliverance. They need to focus on Jesus. The Bible says, look unto me and be saved. Behold the Lamb of God. How can they be saved? They keep talking about themselves. They're filled with the devil. I make no apologies for that. I read in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1. I couldn't find the statement today, but I read it. Where Sister White says that those who are, 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 are so caught up in themselves, they need to repent and realize that it's, it's more than yourself. Are you to be saying amen? Oh, the devil goes to church. And the Bible says we shouldn't be speaking our own ways or doing our own pleasures on the Sabbath day. And sometimes we find ourselves talking about ourselves all the time. Oh, friends, are we a devil in God's house? Listen. In Revelation 22, verse 8 and 9, when John received the revelation and he was so excited and he was so happy and in the presence of an angel, he started to fall down and try to worship the angel. But what did this holy angel tell John to do? All right, it says, I, John, saw these things. I heard. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me the, the things. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant of thy brethren and the, the prophets, to them of them that keep my sayings of this book, worship God. So listen, someone that is leading you according to God's word, leading you according to God's way, they will direct you back to worshiping who? They will direct you back to God. Direct you back to the Bible. Direct you back to the spirit of prophecy. Direct you back to the worship of God. If that's going to say amen. amen. A devil wants to steal the time, attention, and worship that belongs to God. No wonder why the devil goes to church. He wants the place of God. Oh Lord, am I a devil? We got to ask ourselves this as we're studying today. Are you going to say amen? amen? All right. We got to ask ourselves this as we're studying. Lord, am I a devil? The Bible says, now watch this friends. The devil is not going to hell alone. He's going to hell with other people. They say misery find com right? finds company, right? The devil is trying to bring other people with him. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3 and 4. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great dragon, red dragon, having seven horns and, and seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of... Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. The, 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 the stars are the angels. And he did cast them to the earth. So with the devil's teal, he drew the stars of heaven. All right. I'll come back to this point. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be devoured, ready to be delivered, for her to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, friends, there's two points I want to mention here. First point. The devil wants to draw people with him down the road to where? Destruction and perdition. 
The devil is not content with being unhappy alone, unholy alone. He wants company. Oh, friends, am I a devil? Am I trying to lead people away from God because I'm unhappy, because I don't have what I want, because I'm un discontent? I want to lead people with me? He drew the angels of heaven with his tail. What's a tail? What's a tail? What's a tail? Isaiah 9, verse 16. The ancient and the honorable is the head. And the prophet that teaches what? Lies. He's what? With false teaching, he will try to bring people with him down to hell. That's what the devil does. Oh, Lord, am I a devil? Am I causing people to lose their hold on God by teaching them wrong things? And let me say this. You need to pray and fast for the Holy Spirit every time you open the Bible. You know that? Yes. Because the devil, did it cut off? All right. Even this? All right. It's still alive? All right. So, friends... We need to pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I know the devil's mad at this. I did not prepare this. I could not prepare this. This is too powerful for me to even put together. I know this was you. I'm asking you for the Holy Spirit to guide us as we study. Please, dear Father, be with the electricity as we continue to furnish and finish up our message, we pray. And also those online may be blessed as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So listen, friends. The devil does not want to go to hell alone. He wants to bring people with him. And we need to, when we study the Bible, you need to pray hard. Because the Bible says the prophet that teaches lies, he's the tail. You know the devil is ready to teach us every time we open the word? He will give a scripture that comes from God and then give his own understanding. Twist the understanding. And as we're sitting at the feet of Jesus, without studying the Bible with prayer, the devil's there to teach you God's word. Are right? you saying amen? And the devil will not go to hell alone. So what is he going to do? Then, with that false understanding, then they will teach others. And without the Holy Spirit, we receive a false understanding of God's word. Because the devil is teaching the word. Are you with me? Say amen. All right? Now, friends, there's a point I want to make here. Oh, I could just stay here all day. You know, in the book of Leviticus, the Bible says that the oil of frankincense... It was right near the table of showbread. Why? Why was the oil next to the table of showbread? Because we need the Holy Spirit to study the word. The devil will use the word to take us away from God. Right? We say amen. He will misinterpret it. He will change it to his own interpretation to make us think that it's God's word. All right? The second thing I want to say, all right, going back to Revelation 12, Verse 3, verse 4. It says, He drew the, the, the third of the angels with his what? With his tail. Now watch this. And the Bible says, He wanted to devour the child as soon as it was what? So the devil wants to destroy the young in the faith. The child. Those who are just born. They won't come for the stronger. They know the word. They won't come for those who are mature in Christ. They go for those who are little, those who are growing, those who are love the Lord, but they're growing. He'll come to devour you. So listen, friends, listen, 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 listen. You are not a baby Christian. Let me just say that. You are not a what? A baby Christian. But the devil thinks you are. Are you going to be saying amen? The devil thinks we are, but we need to show him by God's grace that we are strong in the word. The Bible says if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived, but they can't be deceived because there's holding on to the word of God. Right? If you say amen. All right, friends. So the devil uses tales instead of scripture. Text. He uses secrets instead of scripture. He uses babblings instead of Bible. He uses goss gossiping instead of the gospel. We need to be aware of the devil's methods. He did it in heaven, so he's going to do it here on, on earth. He will use the Bible to take you away from God. Let's look at seven things the devil does. All right, Number one, the devil will persecute God's people. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. He comes after Christ and then his people. Revelation 12, 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. So the dragon, the devil, was fighting Jesus. He will fight God's truth. He will fight the principles. He will fight the standards. He will fight the interpretations. He will fight the understanding because they're a devil. By the way, this is not a hopeless message. Can devils be cast out? Yes. All right. Can Jesus free us from the power of Satan? Yes. 
So if you see yourself like this, oh, it's not doom and gloom. This is a message of what? Repentance. Verse number 13. And the dragon saw that he was cast out of, uh, uh, into the earth, and he persecuted the woman. So the devil's after God's people. And remember Revelation chapter 12, friends. The, the devil, the dragon is wrought with the woman, but meant to make war with the remnant of her. See, who keep what? The commandments of God and have the testimony. So who's the devil really angry at? Those who really have truth. Think about that. He's really attacking those who really have what? Truth. All right. Number two. The devil misquotes scripture. Oh, we need to know this. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, lest we, the devil take advantage over us, we are not ignorant of his what? Devices. How does the devil work? He will take the Bible and misquote scripture and twist it and make us think something that's not there. Watch this. Matthew chapter 4. The Bible says in verse 6 that the devil said to Jesus, and he said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, fall, jump off the cliff. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, to, and, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time the dash thy foot against the stone. So Satan quoted from Psalm 91. Now Psalm 91 says this, for if he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways, it says, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. What's the difference? Listen now. If you read Psalm 91 in its context, it's talking about, it says, I'm under the shadow of the Almighty, right? Thousands shall fall, right? So you're, you're, you're protected during God's time of trouble. You're protected during the time of trouble, and you're in God's plan. You following me? The devil wanted to quote Matthew 4 saying, listen, you need, here's God's protection, but I'm going to remove his plan. His plan is not for you to jump off. You see what I'm saying? He quoted something, but took it straight out of the context. And then he quote all of it. Context. All thy ways. All God's ways. God didn't want him to jump off. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. That's how the devil works. He takes a scripture, use it out of context. Lord, am I a devil? Listen. Verse, number, verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle, subtle than any beast in the field, which the Lord had made. Notice it says, And he said, Satan said to the woman, Yea, had God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What did he do? He misquoted the word. Every, you can't eat of every tree? That's what God said? No, that's not what God said. God said, Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree you can freely eat. Right? But one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Are you with me? Say amen. So the devil uses Bible to take us away from God. Are you with me? Say amen. Oh, friends, am I a devil in God's church? Listen, what if there's constant new light, like the Sabbath school said, new revelations? What do we do? What do we do? Listen, Testimony to Church, volume 5, page 293, paragraph 1. There are a thousand temptations in disguise. Prepared for those who have the light of truth. And the only safety for any of us in receiving new doctrine, new interpretation of the scriptures, without, watch this, first submitting it to the brethren of experience. She says, if you have new light, someone, uh, here, bring it to somebody who's been studying their Bible for a long time. That's what she says. If we don't do that, we're going to be tripped up. Are you following me, friends? Lay it before them and in a humble, teachable spirit with earnest prayer. And if they see no light in it, yield to their judgment. For the multitude of counselors, there's what? Safety. Do you see what I'm saying here, friends? It's just like me having no experiencing in plumbing. And I go talk to someone that's not a plumber. I talk to an a electrician. Are you following me? To give me... How to plumb? No, no, no. I talked to the plumber. Years of experience. So, friends, if, the, if there's someone or anyone you know trying to twist your mind, that's what we are to do. And that's what the devil does. He will misquote scripture. Jesus said in John chapter 6, he had 12 disciples. One of them was what? Uh, the devil was in Christ's ministry. Listen, the devil was in Christ's ministry. What does this mean? That devil will be all over unto the close of probation. He'll be in the conference churches. He'll be in the present truth self-supporting churches. He'll be everywhere. Are you with me? Say amen. We have to 
pray. Notice, Judas was one of those persons that misquoted the scriptures. All right? Desire of Ages, page 719, paragraph 2. From that time, when he expressed doubts and confused the disciples, Judas, he introduced controversies and misleading statements, repeating the argument urged upon the scribes and the Pharisees against the claims of Christ. I want to read the bold part there. Judas interpreted as evidences against its truthfulness. He would introduce texts of scripture that had no connection with the truths that Christ was presenting. These texts separated from their connection, their context, perplexed the disciples and increased the, the discouragement that was constantly pressing upon them. So Judas, listen, when he learned, when Jesus said, my kingdom is out of this world, and he began to explain the spirituality of Christ's kingdom. Judas was like, what? I thought we are going to get mansions and cars. I thought it was an earthly kingdom. What? You know what? I, I still want it. Let, let, me, let me find some scripture here and, and make it seem as if it's material. Because he loved money. Are you with me? Say amen. And we need to ask ourselves, Lord, am I trying to twist the Bible to suit my own ways? That's what the devil was trying to do. Oh, friends, am I a devil in the church? These things are going to repeat until the close of probation. Matthew 24. I'm just going to go quickly through this. Matthew 24, Jesus says, let no man what? Why did he say the first sign? Let no man deceive you. Because in the last days, the devil's running to and fro. Seeking who he may devour. Going to this church, that church, this group, that group. Are you with me saying amen? And the Bible says, friends, and John chapter 10, John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice and what? Follow me. Verse 5. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. So test everything with the Bible. All right, we say amen. That's how we stay close to Christ. All right, friends. In Matthew 24, Jesus says, don't even trust if, if someone says Christ is here or Christ is there. Christ is in the desert, right? It says... It, then if any man shall say, Lo, Christ is, he is, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. If there are, there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, that shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if they were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Behold, I, I told you before, wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth, behold, he is in the secret chambers. The devil always works in secret. I want to let you know that. Believe it not. So listen, there's a physical application to this. If you say Christ is in the desert or the wilderness, but we'd never get the spiritual application. What's the spiritual application? People will go to and fro. This is what the Bible says, right? Christ is here. This is what it's saying. Christ is there. That's what that's saying. Oh, forget that interpretation. It says, believe it not. Are you with me? Say amen. There's a spiritual application to this verse. Misleading applications. False interpretations, false understandings. And notice it says, it says, let no man deceive you. And notice it says, the very elect would not be deceived. Why? Because they know their, they know their Bibles. They know their Bibles. Am I a devil in God's church? Deceiving people, misleading people? Oh, friends, listen. We need to pray for each other. The devil's constantly trying to bring false teachings. My brother just said he heard false teachings today, right? All over, running rampant. We need to pray for each other. And I'm showing this verse to show us that it's going to last all the way until Jesus comes. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. The devil will deceive until Christ comes. It's not going to stop. So don't think just because you're in a present truth group that you're saved. Don't think just because people are loving the Lord and having worship and fellowship that you're safe. I would encourage you to read the sneers of Satan. Under the chapter, uh, Great Controversy, the Sins of Satan. You know, when the preacher is getting ready to preach his sermon, the devil knows who needs to be there, and he causes something to happen so that they don't show up? Oh, yeah, the devil is in the church. All right, number three, the devil works through accusing. All right, does the devil come to church? Oh, yes, Revelation 12, verse 10. It says, I heard a loud voice from, uh, uh, saying, in heaven, now has come salvation and strength, the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. The accuser of our brethren is cast down. So the devil is accusatory. Are you to say amen? That's not the spirit of Christ. Judas constantly was finding fault with other people. Even John chapter 12, I read it today, looked at someone, whispered in the, the disciples' ear, how come this woman 
want the, the, the oil. They should have gave it to the poor. Remember that? Instigating, gossiping, making them look bad. That's the work of the devil. We should be talking about Christ, uplifting each other, praying for each other. The devil has an accusatory, accusatory spirit and a killing spirit. The Bible says in John 8 verse 44, Jesus, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil. Why? The desires of the devil, your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he's a liar and the father of it. So the devil wants to tear down and kill people's reputation. Are you with me saying that? Killing people's reputation. The devil will always come to kill those who are preaching the truth. All those who are holding up to God's word. Every person. From Genesis to Revelation. Friends, are we? Am I a devil in God's church? Number four, the devil will betray. He will work, he will work in the church to betray. The Bible says, and the supper being under, the devil now having put into the heart of Judas, Iscariot, Simon's son to what? Betray him. So betraying each other, tearing the, each other's back, going, saying, the work of betrayal is of the devil. Are you with me, friends? All right, number five, the devil seeks to destroy. First Peter chapter five, verse eight, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may what? Devour. The devil's trying to destroy everyone holding on to God. He wants to destroy your relationship with God. He wants to destroy your relationship with other people. He wants to destroy every single thing he can. Let me just say this, friends. Genesis chapter two, Genesis chapter three, the devil came to Adam and Eve. Question, did the devil go to Adam or Eve? Which one? Why did the devil go to Eve? Let me ask another question. Judas was a devil. The Bible says, one of you is a devil. John chapter 6, right? Did the devil go to Jesus or did the devil go to the disciples? Which one? The devil will always go to the weaker. Am I a devil in God's church? They will never talk to those who know the word. I notice in my ministry, I mean, just not just mine, but watching others and seeing how the devil works. Growing up, the devil always works to lead people astray who are not in position. They want to work through everyone else, the weaker vessels, the younger, the, those who are just born, the child, devour them. Why don't you go to the strong man? But the Bible says you got to bind the strong man before you go to the house. But they want to go around the strong man. Are you with me, friends? Jesus is the great shepherd. He watches for the sheep. He put me in also position to watch for the sheep. Are you going to say amen? I'm watching for every one of you. If you know anyone that fits that prescription, oh friends, you have to beware. And if you fit that prescription, you need to pray and ask God for deliverance. Are you going to say amen? All right, friends. Notice, number six. The devil wants to make war with the remnant of her seed. We study this. All right, the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. The devil hates the spirit of prophecy. He will always be there with those who are trying to hold up God's truth. Are you with me? Say amen. And number seven, the last one, the devil wants to hinder God's work. First, first Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you. That's what Paul is saying. Who would have come? Even I, Paul, once again. But Satan, what? Hindered us. The devil will always hinder God's work. That's why Sister White says, we have more to fear from where? Within than from where? Without. The hindrances to strength and success are far greater in the church itself than the, than the world. Than the world. Now, friends, we have to pray for each other. Are you with me saying amen? That your greatest enemies in these last days is not church, the papacy, or state America. Your greatest enemies in these last days are those you know who claim the name Christian, those who hold Bibles. Now, let me say this. Your greatest enemy is yourself, but outside of yourself, <laughs> your greatest enemy next are those who hold Bibles and claim to be Christians. So friends, we have more to fear from within than from without. The Bible says that Satan can transform his ministers into angels of light. People in the Bible that were once spiritual became devils. King Saul was anointed by God, but the Bible says that evil spirit came upon him. He was filled with the devil. Are you with me? All right, friends. I'm going to bring this to a close. Lord, I hope I did your message justice. First John chapter 3, verse 8, the Bible says, 
He that committed sin is what? Of the devil. Let's examine ourselves. Lord, am I, am I a devil? Do I have devilish ways? For the devil sinned it from the beginning. For this purpose, watch this now, the Son of God was manifested that he might what? Destroy the works of what? So what do we need if we have these characteristics? What do we need if someone has these characteristics? We need Jesus to destroy the work of what? The devil. Can he do it, friends? Oh, friends, listen. Don't take what I'm going to say wrong, but Jesus died for devils. Jesus was crucified for devils. Jesus wants to save devils. He wants to deliver us from the devil's grip, from the devil's power, from the devil's traits, from the devil's characteristics. Jesus came to set devils free. Are you going to say amen? That's it. The demoniac legions of demons tearing himself. Jesus came to set demons free. And if we commit sin, we're of the devil. Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. We need to open our heart to Christ. How can we see Jesus bleeding on that cross of Calvary? How can we see Jesus walking to the road of uh, 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 Golgotha? How can we see Christ with the cross on his back? How can we see Christ with the nails in his hands and feet, the blood trickling down his face? He's thirsty, saying, I thirst. And yet, see, that that doesn't have power to change our heart. That doesn't have power to make us like Christ. By beholding, we become changed. Are you me say amen? Oh, friends, we need to, sometimes we look at prophecy, we look at the one who gave us the prophecy, Jesus Christ. We need a change of heart. Lucifer studies prophecy, but he's still mad. Revelation chapter 12, having great wrath, but he knows time is short. You're still angry. You still have the character of the devil, and you're still studying. We need to study Jesus. Are you going to say amen? Jesus came that he might destroy the work of the devil. And that's why in Luke chapter 4, verse 34 to verse 35, when the devil came to church, what did Christ do? Cast it off. Saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked them, saying, hold thy peace, come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out and heard him not. Jesus can deliver us from the power of Satan, from these evil traits of character that are destroying each other and taking us away from God. God wants to save us. Are you going to say amen? Desire of Ages. Watch this now. Page 311, paragraph 2. The plan of redemption contemplates our complete recovery. What do we read? We must reflect the image of Jesus how? Fully. The plan of redemption contemplates our complete recovery from the power of Satan. Christ always separates the contrite soul from sin. He came to destroy the works of the devil. He made provision that the Holy Spirit shall be imparted to every repentant soul to keep him from sinning. The complete redemption in Christ. God can make us kind and loving. God can turn our mouth to something sweet. God can, every time we open our mouth or our mind, something spiritual is coming out. Every time we think about somebody or the Lord places blessings in your, in, in your mouth. Are you with me? Complete restoration. That's what we need, friends. How do we get this? James chapter 4, verse 7 and verse 8. Submit yourself, surrender yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and what? He will? He will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will what? Draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. We must surrender to Christ. Lord, I submit myself. I'm drawing near to you. I will resist the devil. I will resist these thoughts. I will resist these words. And the devil will flee from us. And friends, as we bring this to a close, notice these last two quotations. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. How precious to the tempted soul is the positive promise. Now, if one in trouble and temptation keeps his eyes fixed on who? On Jesus. And draws nigh to God, talking of his goodness and his mercy, Jesus draws nigh to him and his annoyances that he thought almost unbearable will vanish. So when we come to Jesus, keeping our eyes on him, all of these things that are on us will vanish. They will disappear. Satan hates the presence of God. We have to say in his presence. Are you going to say amen? 
Watch this now. Last quotation. My life today, page 300, paragraph 3. We read this the other day. I'll read it again. Jesus has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still loves us and pities the erring, seeking to draw them to himself that he may give them divine aid. He knows that a demon power is struggling in every soul, striving for the mastery. But Jesus came to break the power of Satan and to do what? To set the captives free. Friends, this message you heard today, I did not think about this, premeditate this. This was God. What would you do with the truth God has given to you, friends? Today, God wants to set us free. Lord, I don't want the character of the devil. I don't want to lead others astray. I don't want to lead myself astray. I don't want to be coming to church week after week, but having all these characteristics in my heart. I want that the devil to be cast out. And I want to be free. I want to sit at the feet of Jesus. How do you say amen? Yeah. Now friends, listen. God is calling us to submit to him. We have to submit to him. We have to surrender to him. All the things in our hearts that is unlike Christ, we must surrender. And Jesus can break the devil's power in our lives. How do you say amen? Yeah. Let's pray, friends. Let's close. Father in heaven, I said what you wanted me to say. We pray now for the Holy Spirit to help us. We surrender ourselves to thee, Lord, for we know that the devil is working for keeps. He wants to hold everyone in a state of inactivity, hindering the work of the gospel. He wants to hold us in a state of being far from thee. He wants to hold us in a state of degradation. But Father, we know that you came to destroy the works of the devil, and today do it in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, in our homes do it for us for we don't want this enemy within hindering the work without hindering the three angels message hindering the gospel to the world save us we pray we believe help thou our unbelief we surrender our lives to thee and we thank you for your goodness and we thank you for setting us free in jesus holy name we pray amen